The Authenticity Quotient panel discussion was recorded live during the 2023 Sparta Conference. We apologise for the brief moments of low audio quality during this recording. Some portions of the discussion may have been removed due to copyright or commercial sensitivity. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. Um, fantastic size group, I think, because what I'm really looking forward to here is just having a, a good conversation. That's something I always really push for when it comes to talking about disability and really engage your audience. So uh, just to give you a quick brief overview of how this is going to run, I've got two fantastic panellists with me, Jai and, and Rachel. I'll get them to introduce themselves and the sort of work they're doing and we'll get to see some of their work with a few video clips. Um, but before we get into that, as a bit of a preamble, I guess I'll set the scene for what we're talking about today, um, part of my vision of working in this space, and, and tell a bit of my own personal story as well. And then out the other side of hearing from Jai and Rachel, then very much Q&A, and really want to engage, so please, uh, anything, um, and, and it doesn't have to be a question, I think this is a conversation, feel free to tell stories, very much keen to hear about NZFC and what you're doing in this space. Um, and, and yeah, we'll take it from there. But to kick into it, um, I guess as, uh, as a vision for what we're, or what we're seeking to achieve here, um, I'm actually part of a group that's just launching an initiative called Disability Media Collective. Uh, it's a charitable trust that's risen from the ashes of another trust where we've inherited a bit of money. We're still figuring out very much what we're going to do in a tangible sense, but we have set our vision and it is very much, we just seek to increase the representation of disability in the media. That is the vision, that's what we're seeking to do. And that comes in a variety of ways and a variety of outcomes. It is people on screen, it is people behind the screen, it is people in decision making places, it's people leading places like Screen Wellington. Um, that is how we're gonna see a shift in, this, uh, in, in the representation of people with disabilities and how people with disabilities are integrated into society. Um, and it all comes back to places like this, being in a room, talking about it, and ultimately what I hope, and I've talked to Jai and Rachel about this, is just seeing more people producing content about people with disabilities. That would be a big shift forward. So that's basically what we're seeking to achieve. Um, many ways to get there, and I think this is just one of those ways, another step. Uh, big, big believer in iterative change, social change takes time. Um, Moving ahead, I guess a bit of my background, where I've come from, or what I'm doing at the moment. I am chief executive of ABLE. Uh, ABLE is, it's, it's one I struggle to describe well because I feel like it's, it's more of a feeling. It's a fantastic place. It's an organization that is very much greater than the sum of its parts. On the surface, it is a service delivery mechanism. We deliver captions and audio description for free to air broadcast in New Zealand, and we do it well. It's a machine, like I'm not part of the operations, I'm just a big fan of the operations. Uh, and they deliver about 550 hours of captions per week to the broadcast industry in New Zealand. It is phenomenal, uh, fantastic team. Uh, and then we do about 130 hours of audio description per week. Uh, for those that don't know audio description, it is a little bit the poorer cousin to captions. Uh, captions are very much, you know, people get captions, they know captions. Uh, first and foremost, it is, putting on screen for people who are deaf or hard of hearing what everyone else hears, so whether it's voice or, or, or um, noises, sound effects, music, that is represented on screen, that is captions. So it's for that audience, but it also very much serves people where English may be a second language, it's great for literacy, uh, and also it's been talked about a lot in the media recently, it's, it's embraced by Gen Z. Uh, captions have just become ubiquitous as we consume content in, in ever-changing ways and environments where it doesn't make sense to have sound on. Audio, descriptions I've, audio description, I feel, is following in the footsteps, and people will know about AD more in the future. Similar to captions, it very much enhances media that produces work so hard to create. Uh, and it is a, it's an audio layer of audio to describe what's happening in the scene that people who are blind and visually appeared may not be able to see. But for anyone, I feel, as I say, very much enhances the media. And as we go about these our lives in this busy world where we often multitasking, it's just another way of being fully immersed in what we're watching. So that is what we do day to day. But ABLE is very much a, just a fantastic place where, for a start, so much content is consumed. Like it is, I don't know if there's anywhere else in New Zealand where so much uh, media is watched. So it's full of people who 
care about the craft, care about the meaning, care about what we do, but just love pop culture as well. Uh, so a fantastic place to work. Uh, prior to being with Able, I was with a production company for about 14 years, producing a lot of content. Uh, but just to fast forward, I guess, the intro and the preamble, what I wanted to really talk about was uh, how I ended up with a disability and just touch on that. Uh, so to cut a long story short, I basically broke my neck 23, 24 years ago uh, by putting my head in the wrong place in a rugby scrum. That was as simple as it was. Uh, 18 year old guy grew up uh, down south loving his footy and uh, came to one single game, put my head in the wrong place. That was a, a different life and, and moving forward from there. From there, I ended up at Burwood Hospital, which is uh, the spinal unit down in South Island, which is a whole story unto itself that uh, Paula Fetty Jones is actually in production doing a, her, her take on that at the moment, which I'm really looking forward to. And then from there, I actually fell into wheelchair rugby, uh, fell into sport, ended up playing with this guy. Um, and that was you know, a sport that I loved. I fell in love with playing the sport and got to do, you know, have so many opportunities with that. But the greatest thing looking back on it is it accelerated my way of living with a spinal cord injury because I was suddenly around a bunch of young guys who were just killing it in life. They are you know, they're either working or studying, they're playing sport, they're traveling, their wives and girlfriends and, and kids. And, and I think it was just for me, it was this fresh face, very much fresh, <laughs> fresh faced boy from Invercargill, 18 year old, just figuring out life in a wheelchair. I was like, right, this is how it's done. This is what it looks like. This is what traveling looks like. Um, fast forward a bunch of years, I played that for a lot of years, loved it. It was time to make space for other things in my life, uh, which is now very much couple of kids and a wife and a, and a villa under renovations, which is a whole other world, uh, which is very fulfilling and I love as well. Um, I say all this for, to really, there's four messages out of that, that, that very much truncated, once over lightly telling of how I broke my neck and ended up in a wheelchair and what life has been like since. One is because I think there is a curiosity around disability to be fulfilled. I think disability is intriguing. And I think there's stories to tell about disability and people want to know about disability. Um, so I'm very much upfront and happy to share my story just for that sake alone. Secondly, I think, um, I think it's important to show what a full life with a disability can look like. And for me, that is right now uh, having a career and a place that I love to work with kids who are, you know, keep me on my toes and, and make the days very full. Uh, wife I love and a, and a house, like that is a full life. It's, uh, I get to live it because of many people who did a lot of work uh, before I came along in terms of, what's the word? I guess challenging, uh, advocating, uh, fighting for the rights of people with disabilities. That's why I get to live the life I get to live now. But I think there are still expectations to be lifted that everyone should expect that. And that's, I guess, long story short, that's another reason why I'm pretty quick to tell my story and what my life looks like with a disability, trying to change those perceptions and raise expectations. Uh, I think the third one, make sure I get this right, I wrote it down. Um, third one, which I didn't really touch on within the, the retelling of where I'm up to in life is, but an important point, I think, is it hasn't been a linear journey. It hasn't been our two axes of time and living with disability and things got easier. It's been challenging all the way. I think wheelchair rugby let me figure out life very quickly and life was pretty sweet. Figuring out life with kids and, uh, and getting together with my partner who, for her, was all disability was fresh. That was some biggest, the biggest challenges of my life with disability. Uh, so it's not, you know, as opposed to a linear graph that goes like that, it's, uh, it's all over the place. Like life. For me, at least, with a disability, has been figuring it out a lot on the, on the way. The final point I tell uh, a story about my life with a disability. So I look back to that time, and I think about if I didn't have rugby, what would have been my touch points for disability? What would have been sort of an example of how I could have lived my life? And I think there could have been a void there. And I think that's why I think it's so important to tell stories, and I think where the media has a big part to play and we as producers have a big part to play because if we tell more stories, if more stories are told, people with disabilities 
you know, I get to see myself reflected back on screen. Joe gets to see himself back on, reflected on screen. Uh, at the same time, there is that dual audience, which Rachel articulates really well. People who have nothing to do with disability get a reference point for disability, which ultimately helps you know, people with disabilities live a full life. So those are, those are the reasons that I, am, uh, I guess, share my story and, and very much up for telling that story. That is uh, far too much taking up space in the room from me, so I'll wrap it up there uh, and hear from these fantastic people beside me. Starting with Jai, and I guess um, similar on that, on that theme of just telling stories and sharing stories, it would be great to hear a bit about you, how you ended up in a wheelchair, and what, um, what life has been like since. Yeah, totally. I'd just also like to vouch for Dan saying Gen Z, Gen, Gen Alpha, as I'm told now, my kids. Uh, yeah, they watch captions all the time. Like, you don't have to have that. Like, we love watching captions on TV. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, and, and also, funnily enough, um, my mum got a new TV, uh, and I went down to visit her in Tamaki, and um, she said, to me, I'm like, Mum, you've got all your descriptions on. She goes, no, that's just how TV is now. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, uh, look. My, my story is like very similar to Dan, um, and we had our accidents probably within about six months of each other. Uh, mine was further abroad, where uh, I'd been finished uni, I'd worked in New Zealand for like two years, and a couple of mates, we did the typical Kiwi thing, you know, like OE, went to Europe, um, got a van in London, and like we'd brilliant time, you know, we'd travelled all the Mediterranean and. Algarve, yeah, and so I went to a um, island called Eos, which is like 10 hours from nowhere, and um, was uh, waist deep in the water and just went to duck dive for a wave. Yeah, and then hit the bottom, which uh, there was like a sandbar there, which I duck dive through waves all my life and never expect a sandbar. And so what happened was I crushed my fifth vertebrae. Um, I got flown to Os uh, Athens first, and then my insurance company was like, get out of there, you're not going to survive. So they flew me here. <laughs> they they uh, flew me to uh, Austria, and I was there for a month where they like fused my neck. And then I had to come back to New Zealand and do my rehab at Otara. But uh, just as an aside, um, get your travel insurance, because I was the last thing I did before I left, 186 bucks, best, best money I spent. Um, but um, yeah, so I was in the spine unit, and, uh, and this is that representation of people on TV, right? So. I was lying there and I'd played rugby all my life and cricket and it was right on the time of the Sydney Paralympics and on the screen was these guys playing wheelchair rugby and at this stage it's taking me 40 minutes to push from like the spine unit like uh, hospital part of it up to the gym for rehab and it, like now that takes me like seconds and but back then I was like stopping pushing stopping pushing different time too the OTs were like you got to do that yourself I'm not pushing you so <laughs> Um, and, and I seen these guys smashing into each other on TV. I'm like, here's some guys in wheelchairs that like, are smashing, but there's no way I'm gonna be able to do that. Like, that's far out of my league. And it, it took a good year after my accident to kind of build the courage to go along and jump in a chair. And once I seen that I could be functional in the sport and actually contribute, um, I thought maybe there's a chance I could make the Paralympic team to go back to Athens, and, um, which would be a nice circle, right? Uh, and I was quite a ways off. And so at that stage, I just threw everything into it and just was training every day. I got a training, like someone to give me a training schedule. And um, yeah, lucky enough to make the team and go of Dan to Athens. And um, has anyone seen the documentary Mutable? Yeah, we ruined that movie. movie. We, uh, <laughs> We, we went there, we were ranked sixth in the world, and they weren't expecting us to win. And um, we were like the first country outside of the US to win that gold medal. And um, for a country of our size, we were like... Uh, but what, that, what happened then is when I got back to New Zealand, um, got a letter in the post from like, Helen Clark, was Prime Minister at the time, and there was a letter there that said, look, you can go study whatever you want, and like, you get five years, um, we'll pay you, you get a you know, scholarship. And I was like, well, look, I don't want to go back to finance. And I've always loved like, telling stories. And I was crap at English. And, um, but visual storytelling is like, my jam. And so I just enrolled to study editing. And, and I think like, the same thing with Dan. Like, I didn't really like, think around those guys. No limitations on 
what I couldn't couldn't do. So I never went into a disability like, what's my job options if I leave? You know, like who's going to employ me? I just was like, I'm just going to be really good at this as well. And so after I completed it, I uh, I was quite fortunate that at the time um, they were filming a documentary on the Will Blacks at the time, and the production company was like, hey, you should come work for us. And so I was lucky enough that at the time that was Attitude, so they brought me on and I got in there and I just started off at the ground level and just worked my way up and and um and I think for me the pinnacle of knowing that actually I was actually really good at what I'm doing despite what people might perceive as limitations of my hand function and I edit just as fast if not faster than most people because most of editing's in your mind like you are visualizing and you're seeing what happens to me and I get so frustrated at computers that don't work as fast as my mind <laughs> and but anyway so I entered into a couple of international editing awards and um, one of them was in Singapore and got up there for this award, made the finals. So this is all of Asia, Oceania and um, of course you enter it, you don't put on the entry form, oh look, I'm in a wheelchair. And so I rock up there, sitting there and um, anyway, gets close to the editing award. Next thing this, um, one of the ladies that works here comes and taps me on the show, are you dry weight? I'm like, yeah, and she's like, oh. Um, should you win, there's no ramp to get on the stage. Uh, so just go to the side. And uh, yeah, sure enough, I won this award. And um, so but that for me was like validation of like, yeah, despite what people might think is a limitation or that you can find a space in your role that you can actually, you know, complete it just as good as anyone else. And um, yeah, and I, and I think that's also part of having a disability of what you can bring to any job is that often day to day, people like me and Dan, we have to think outside the box just to get places. Mm -hmm. And so often when it comes to work or doing something differently, we think so creatively that we can go, oh, you know, there's problem solving skills we have to do every day. Um, and, and I think if we bring it back now to what I'm doing now with my own production company is, it is really telling those stories so people can see them on TV and see themselves in people. And you know, like, people get older, we all know people like, disability, disability finds us all eventually, right? And so the more stories we can get out there and, and represent ourselves, like, the better. And it's great we're having this discussion here today. Nice. Yeah. Jai just answered all the questions I had for him, just in one hit. <laughs> so that's Jai, uh, yeah. moving on to Rachel. Actually, before I move on to Rachel, I'll say something about Jai. And, um, probably don't know this guy, but I often use you as an example when I'm talking about someone who can live a full life with a disability. Jai is just blowing me away forever, like with two kids, before I had kids, uh, not from knowing how he did it, and I guess I'm figuring it out now. Yeah. Um, but he's a guy who, when we were working together in Greyland, he lived in Takanini, and he'd uh, use a hand bike to get to the train station to get to another train station. It was a long convoluted route. I live in Mount Eden, I don't have to um, but, but no, I talk about an hour, but what I loved about when he made the decision he was going to, that was the way he was going to get to work, he went out and got, bought all this uh, rain gear so that every day he never had an excuse. This is how I get to work. I put on a jacket, I go to work. I've, um, and then, you know, he's usually there, first guy opening up at 7 or 7.30, just massive hours, and I think the work ethic is the biggest thing that stands out for me, for Jai, when I think of Jai. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Rachel, um, I thought it'd be, you know, obviously good to hear about disability, talk about disability, but also from someone who, as an able-bodied person working in this space, what your experiences are like. So I think uh, just as an intro, actually, it'd be good to hear about where you've come from, because you've got, obviously, a big body of work behind you before starting to tell stories uh, about people with disabilities. You want to... Give us that intro. Sure. And Tina Kocha Katua, ko Rachel Toko Ingoa, Ku Tainui Toko Iwi, Ko Nati Mahanga Toko Hapu, Hey Producer Aho. Um, thank you for inviting me. I feel very blessed and honoured to be sitting to, next to these legends. Um, yeah, where did I come from? I don't know how I can follow up after your stories. I played rugby yeah. once, I lasted one season. Yeah. Oh, I did an OE and that lasted for eight years. So that's all I've got on <laughs> you guys. Um, so I have actually had to have a little um, chat with myself earlier and realise I have been actually in the screen sector working up for 30 years and don't have much to show for it, but that's okay. Um, and then I had to have another honest conversation with myself and realised I started in the industry when I was 16, so it's actually about 34 years 
anyway. Um, I predominantly have, I've worked around the world and I've worked across a broad genre of programming. Um, so I do have quite... Oh, you said, my, turn your mic uh, on. I think oh. it might have like, well, that's all right. I can hear me, can't I? Hello. Yeah, yeah. Right now. Um, yeah. Oh, it's such a difference. Um, yeah, so, and predominantly commercial brand shows, so, you know, everything from big reality shows. Um, so coming back from Sydney at the time to Aotearoa and I found myself series producing Attitude was quite a significant change because I came in with a very commercial, nothing else matters but the ratings and not so much authentic storytelling. And so the lens that, then the learnings that I have had since those days and the conversations with these guys and other peers and Tanya Black who's sitting there, some hot conversations we've had, I have learned so much and still are learning about how we shape these stories. And it is, inc it is, it is challenging not being from the community. And I go out of my way to make sure that there's a ring of trust and that it's not my story, it's not my voice, but I'm a facilitator and I'm a connector. I can create those pathways. I can also provide editorial safety. I can be the viewer. I can be that idiot viewer that's going to make that stupid comment. So I can give an overall view of how we're going to put that content out. I do think how we're telling these stories is evolving and very fast. And I think traditionally, people have been burnt from, the, from all communities because stories have been told about them and for them and not by them. So it's so important to have these people in the creative team, behind the scenes. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of layers to unpack and we can only do it as we learn and as we move forward. And be curious and ask lots of questions. Sometimes you get told to piss off and I'm not here to, I'm not here to educate you on my disability actually. Or so, but you've just got to be brave and ask the questions. So yeah, nice. yeah. What's a journey? I think the um, problem with telling people a heads up, the questions you're going to ask, you answered all my questions. Oh. <laughs> okay. But there are some really good things to unpack there. I think um, it'll make more sense unpacking it around some of the clips that we're going to show of production you've been working on recently. Mm. So, um, so to jump into showing some, showing some clips, I think we'll uh, get into Jai's one first. Jai is in the throes of producing a story about the Will Blacks. Yeah. Um, do you want to tell us about this gist of, yep. um, I guess, what we're about to see um, and intro the clip? Yep, i just say oh. thanks, New Zealand on Air, of course. Glenn, it's back there. This is like there, you know, that, without people like New Zealand on Air and that also, you know, giving us the ability to tell these stories, I think, uh, is the big thing. I think um, the story we, uh, when we pitched it, was about a team trying to qualify. So, nothing to do with disability, right? It's more about a, uh, um, you know, this is just a team that's trying to make it to their big goal, which is uh, Paralympics. And I think what we're really trying to do is highlight that it's kind of, um, you know, we want to see these guys as athletes first and that they just have the same hopes and dreams as everyone else, like disabilities aside. So the way we're kind of shooting it and telling it is that the angles always have to be at a way that empowers people and makes them look like, you know, they're in charge and they're in, because, uh, you know, often camera angles are up high, staring down, it doesn't look quite so. Um, and, I, and I think really, um, I suppose the clip shows a bit. And we can yeah, should we watch the clip and yeah. then talk about that and some, yeah. of those, some of those conversations you had in the pre-prod? Yeah. We roll the wheel blanks clip. Nice. Um, a few questions. First yes. of all, yeah, you sort of started touch it on them, but what are, you know, they they do come across as powerful. What are some of the conversations you had in the pre-pod stages about how you're going to film them, um, the talent and and the feeling you wanted to get from people seeing these characters on screen? Yeah, I I think that this this happens quite a bit, and and I think with any disability community, like. It's not as simple as just going to them and saying, hey, we're going to film a story, right? Um, there is a sense of vulnerability, you know, with people with disabilities and, and how much you want to show. Because, um, you know, like, you, it's like being that kid at school again. You don't want to be different from anyone else. And so getting people to buy into that, that you know, like, 
you're actually going to treat this in a way that is going to make them look cool and actually that people aren't going to look at this with pity. And that does take time. That's not a simple, yeah, look, we're going to come and turn up with cameras and we'll film you next week pulling your pants up. You know, like, <laughs> it's, uh, um, it does take a bit of, bit of uh, trust. And, and I think, um, and, and I think, I mean, I was lucky because I've lived in that community and I've been, um, you know, like, I know the guys as well. So they, they know I would treat it the, the, the way it is. But it is a lot of building that trust that, you know, the way it's going to appear without showing them what you're going to put on TV um, is, yeah, I, I think, and, and we, I think how we also built it around is like their, you know, they've got a mutual interest in this is that they're a team that's actually struggling for money, right? And, and their chance to be on, and like thanks to Sky as well, like to put them on a platform like Sky who wants to put them on a prime time slot and then replay it over all their Sky Sport channels, like that's exposure that this team hasn't had. Like even in our days, we never had that kind of exposure. And you know, like when we could say to them and say, look, this is your chance to be in front of New Zealanders and show them what goes into being a wheel black and why next time that person who watched it's at the supermarket and they get that person trying to sell that wheel black pin, they're gonna go, yeah, I've seen that guy on TV and I've seen him having to carry his own wheel bag and he, puts him in his car and he goes to training and this is your chance to show what your life is and, um, and, and I think we didn't really talk too much about the angles how we talked about just before but I think mm. really well, the follow on question was that's talent what about crew like camera soundy uh, any tough conversations there or just having to school them up on how to go about it um, again we were lucky on this is that Sean's worked with both Robin and I a lot over years and with uh, wheelchair rugby or, and around disability so he kind of or he knows a couple of the guys as well, but um, he's one of those cameramen that, uh, like, excuse me, really knows how to um, get on side of the talent, and and he's just like naturally good at just making people feel at ease. And I think, um, and I think probably even more so, I reckon soundies if you're talking technical, like, because they're the people that get up and put microphones on and. You know, they are actually the ones that are up close and with people and like, again, any, any part of the crew that can make people feel at home is, um, mm. yeah, it's a, uh, yeah. Um, I think something about it is you talked about it being a sports doco and wanting to tell that story. Yeah. But what I was saying in the intro is you can't really shy away from disability or maybe I didn't articulate it well, but I find like people, there are some people that talk about disability should just be on screen and it's just there because, but I feel like if it's on screen of the visual disability, you almost, you got to address it. Like, yeah. So how have you gone about writing that clutch of, it's a sports doco, but you got to talk about how they live their lives with disability, right? Yeah, so that, that is a lot of show, show rather than tell. Um, like, and there's slight explana explanation and like, but most of it is that, I mean, in true doco sense, you know, you, you're watching. And so there's a lot of space. Um, like we have scenes where like, referring back to getting dressed, like, Gavin, who's got like less function than me, and he's getting dressed, and it's just like, you know, it takes him 20 minutes, but he doesn't, and he just does it slowly, and all he really says around it is that, you know, when he was in the spine unit, he was, um, you know, wasn't taught this stuff, and it wasn't for rugby, you know, he met people how to do it, and we're just seeing that motion of, without being so avert that he is explaining every function in the, yeah, mm. yeah. Um, pretty keen to get to see Rachel's going to do. One more question though is, uh, what what is the audience you're aiming for? Yeah, it's totally that. Um, it's the wider audience. It's that bringing people into the world of athletes that, yeah, they've got a disability, but um, here's a team that, you know, despite whatever challenges that society puts on them, you know, like they can go out there and, <laughs> to quote Kevin, do whatever they want. Mm. You know, like and yeah. They don't care if someone else thinks they can't, you know, work or they can't have a family. We're going out there and smashing those barriers. So. Yeah. So changing other people's perceptions yeah. of disability. Yeah. It, but all wrapped up in a great sports story. Like, yeah, yeah. Nice. Uh, by stealth. Yeah. Um, Rachel, so keen to hear about uh, something you've produced that was published this year. Do you want to give an intro to the series and what we're about to see on the clip? Uh, yeah. So this is Wheel Life is with Soph and Indy. Um, Soph 
uh, lives as quadriplegic when she fell off her horse six years ago, and Indy is her best friend and cousin and also happens to be one of her carers, which she got talked into and didn't know what she was doing and still doesn't and, you know, all these things. She's like, I'm not a health worker. Oh, my God, what am I doing? But together, that's what makes a show, is their dynamic, their relationship. Um, we'll just, because well, this first little bit kind of intros them and yeah. you'll get a sense straight away of what so one of so um, you know one of the thing, one of the topics or issues she used to deal with on can, the daily. Can we roll the first clip for this is real life. Good. Hi. Uh, Kill. We'll just roll with that. Yeah. There's a little insight into Sophie. Oh. Oh. This needs yeah. relieving me. <laughs> so weird. I'm Sophia. I'm Indy. We're cousins, and I'm also her care. We want to show a light-hearted, fun look into living with a disability. We cover sex and relationships, career, housing, and Indy comes along for the ride. because what I've got to do is I've got to tell the OT why it's not going to work for me. And the occupational therapist goes back to the architect. The architect has to find a way to make it work. Then the plans get sent back to the OT to check that it'll work for my function. Then it goes to ACC to make sure ACC is okay to pay for it. And then it comes back to me. And then probably I'm going to see that there's another thing that doesn't work with the new plans and that a whole cycle starts again. That's why this has taken a year already for me to just get plans that aren't good. I feel like I'm not going to be able to move into that house for at least two years. It's so crazy that after a year you're still living in your backyard. Well, obviously Indy thinks that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> so Soph lives in that little cabin and that house is her house um, that's attached to. So, um, you know, already what we've um, identified uh, a struggle that um, someone like herself lives with and all the red tape that she has to go through to get any mods done. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah. Well, I guess the question is, um, both the intro and that clip, you're into some pretty deep and heavy stuff, like her frustrations that, it's hard to get across, um, can be hard to get across well, but also on the, I guess the, the intro, you're seeing how uh, Indy looks after Sophie. How did you get to that level of trust, I guess? With, with the people. girls, yeah, yeah, it takes time, and again, it was being very clear up front that I'm I'm not there to exploit them. I'm there to facilitate and connect them in. It was really important that Soph and Indy talked about the subjects and topics they wanted to talk about, but we always um, and we're transparent right from the front, right from the get go, because what we had to decide, um, which wasn't favourable, is that we decided that general consensus is that most people don't know or about disability. Um, and it's something that, in Soph's own, own words, people are intimidated by it. So we decided to go back and do very much a disability 101, topics that, have, that Soph's probably already advanced through, but she knew she had to go backwards in order for people to understand to go, to go forward. So we, we chose some topics, some topics we didn't get to cover actually. Um, we did say that if we did get a second season, we'll get a bit more into the nitty gritty now that we've dipped our toe in. We've got people on board, people love them because they are accessible, palatable, fun, funny. I've had quite a lot of feedback, people saying they felt like that Sophie and Indy were their mates, their friends. And that's, that's what we wanted, that key to, to create at least one pathway which we could continue on opening doors later on down the track. That housing, that, the housing episode was the most watched, along with sex and relationships. I wonder why that was. Um, but um, that was that most heated I, I had her. She definitely got a lot more heated. And that's when I would step in and go, you know, it's, it's your story, it's up to you, but maybe we need to tone it down just a little bit um, because the other way we decided to tell this was worthy and important topics, but in a light-hearted manner. So we're not shoving it down people's throats. Yeah. So it was, it was a balancing act. It, like, like with all, everything, every con piece of content we touch, you, you know, it's do we go on the accelerator here? Do we pull back here? What are we trying to articulate here? Um, and that's why if you have a strong director and they're in the room and at the time someone might say something 
this is with all content we're directing, and you, you might question that and think, have we explained that clearly? It, to the person telling the story, they're like, no, I'm pretty sure I explained that. And you're like, well, hang on, most people, again, won't know what you are talking about, so let's just give it a bit more context or, yeah, but it's really just collaborating. So similar to Jai, uh, made for general audiences as the first audience? Yes, we did, and I would say that This Is Where Life is quite a safe series moving forward. I, I personally don't think we've mastered the dual audience yet, but that's what I'm looking to do down the track and soon. Dual audience being for general and for disability. Um, yeah. what, what's been the feedback now that it's out there in the world from both audiences, or either or? This is real life, yeah. I mean, um, we've had predominantly um, great positive feedback from both the disability community and general audiences. Um, but I think like it's important to acknowledge like with all communities, all people, you are never going to please everyone. Someone will always think differently or, and, and Soph's had a bit of backlash. Mm. Soph is like made of steel, that girl, so she's just like, I don't care. And in fact, she's so much, I don't care that I sometimes have to manage the socials to kind of reply to people, because she's just like, delete. Like, <laughs> so, you know, you, you know, you have this, we have, we're a team, so, yeah. and we've got each other's back, like that's, that's, that's the thing. Nice. That's really important for everyone that you work with to know that I've got you, you know, like yeah. I'm not gonna let you fall and I'm, you know, I'm here to support you in every way I can, so. Speaking about, I've got you, uh, for the next clip, let's go into this. <laughs> oh, yeah. I guess as a producer, director, you're writing the balance of looking after your talent and, and getting the goods with the shot. Do you, want to, uh, do you want to throw to this clip or should we just watch yes, it? Yes, well, even though we've sort of partly seen it like five times. So we, can we throw to the other go. clip? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, you alright? I'm Dan. I'm nice Indy. It's nice to meet you. Hi. Good. Hi. Uh, you alright? Yeah. <laughs> I'm fine. Hi. Hi, Dan. Nice to meet you finally. Nice to meet you. Do you want to come on through to the meeting room? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Sorry. I feel like this is dramatic. Interest. It was. <laughs> So when I got feedback on this clip, I love that you kept it in because it's um, it's very real and uh, human instinct is to go and help someone who's just struggling to get over a little step in a doorway. Uh, why was it important that you didn't? And, and leave yes, it's it? kind of it's, it looks like a simple shot, but it's actually quite layered. First, there's the aha moment of I can't believe she can't get into a standard door. There's that that I would take for granted every day, right? So it's thinking thinking differently. Two. Um, both Indy, who carer, stood back, but also the real estate agent stood back, and he, and it's important to not direct, that you have to hold on that shot, because again, that's a, you know, showcasing the everyday multiple challenges that those that live with disability have to deal with. Um, but yes, for that very point, they, the realtor had, had experience with people that live with disability and knew not to just rush in and help you need to ask first. So there's, there's all these different things. And yeah, the whole, about how the shooting of, you do have to hold on shots longer and let the action play out. For both scripted and unscripted, it's really important, make more time in your call sheets. If you want, oh, can you just do that shot again? Oh, can you just walk through that door again? Oh, forget it. Like, you can build some of it in. It, it's so dependent on the individual and what their disability is and what their requirements are. And it's really important to find that out and pre-prod and build it in. If it's a scripted and they have to do wardrobe, they, will, they might need people to help them get changed. That's, you know, there's a lot to consider. Um, you know, whether it's ramp access, um, accessible bathrooms, there's a lot. Um, but on that note, actually, how you were saying holding on your guy that took yeah. 20 minutes to get change, our other battle was, oh, this is short form digital content. How am I gonna sustain my audience if we're showing a shot for three hours, <laughs> you know, in real time? So uh, creatively, my suggestion was we'd do a, like a split screen. So you might have the action of Soph still trying to get up the ramp. Meanwhile, Indy's at the restaurant ordering the food down the bottom of the screen. So there was just a stylistic technique so we're still being able to show both and not fast editing it. So that's kind of how we got around mm. that. But cool. yeah, I feel like I've talked a lot. Thank you. Sorry. We are running out of time, so I'm gonna just uh, give one more question each and then uh, open up to the floor. Uh, Jai, I guess wrapping two questions into yep. one. One is, um, where do you see us going from here? What's the future 
for disability representation on screen and and what's your advice for people who want to create content in this space? I look I, I just hope there's more like because the more representation out there the more acceptance is and more people understand you know in, in public and I think I, th I think going forward like and I don't think it has to be like if you're talking drama scripted like it doesn't have to be the main character it can be like a B character but enough to be in there to be like they're not an afterthought they're not the you know um, and, and I think you can slowly unpeel the way that they live as part of that you know like and I think um, that's and, and, and if you're talking factual I think yeah like I think the more we can wrap just everyday stories so people connect with what's going to happen like you know Soph and Indy like just trying to find a house day to day thing mm. you know like or you know for us the Will Blacks it's like you know just a team trying to do something and it's just wrapping disability stories into uh, those that'll you know capture that wider audience and then just slowly bring them into into our world and um, mm. yeah nice. similar Rachel and, and really I uh, would love the perspective of advice for an able-bodied producer who sees a good story to tell, doesn't know how to go about it maybe, or, or is not sure, what would your advice for them to be? Uh, telling stories about, that haven't had people with disabilities or specifically wanted to tell a story yeah. about a disability. Assuming that someone that has come to them, perhaps they want to share their story or be part of the team to tell stories about that community, but not necessarily about themselves, which is also very important. Um, because, for example, so again she didn't want to tell her story and she shouldn't have to tell her story but she wants to be part of the co-papa about telling stories of the community so it's tricky to navigate but 100 percent you need consultancy and not just only consultancy and it might be more than one consultant you need the team like Soph and Indy were co-creators Indy so Indy equally has a voice because she's Soph's carer so through by default she knows a lot about disability and she's also her social protector too, like massively. So she was even harder <laughs> to, to bring on board than so was actually. So um, someone said something to me recently, they want to do something for the community and they're like, I can't speak to the community by myself. I want someone else in the team from the community that's at, a, uh, at the creative level that might be a researcher or someone that can help me shape these stories so it's not all on me. And we would still have consultancy on top of that as well. So it's just really important. Uh, that, that would be my biggest piece of advice. Nice. I think that's um, probably now is the crux of the title of the session, the authenticity quotient, which is something I first heard uh, spoken by Cliff Curtis here at Sparta a few years ago and talking about, you know, um, not stories not being told about uh, a group, but coming from within the group uh, mm. is where the authenticity comes from. Um, brilliant, thank you. Not a lot of time, but uh, hopefully some time for any questions or conversations or stories from before. Uh, hi, I'm Pam. Um, I have um, worked as a producer, and have struggled to, because you're working in an agile space, mm. so you, everything's done super quick mm. to get a production up and running, and I have had someone with a disability who was coming into a space um, that wasn't accessible and I hadn't because you're just trying to get everything up and running it was a full building yeah mm. multiple steps in and then multiple you know no lift access or anything so even like costume like getting grumpy about yeah <laughs> stuff because they're like where's the lift but I'd like to think about that moving forward more I didn't I hadn't had that before and mm. I'm engaged in ensuring that I am creating a space there's actually mm. two people sitting in front of you that's actually just starting to work in that space uh, Dan do you want to talk to yeah um, what, what, what yeah resources are there yeah well yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah I think um, yeah very much cure into I think uh, oh, if, if you don't mind Taylor I might just give my experience I think um, yeah. My, um, I'll give my take and then uh, get a better one from Taylor. I think, um, I think one thing I'm very big on for the disability sector is making sure or giving the space to for people to captain their own ship. So for the person with a disability to be part of the conversation of how it's going to work. Okay, we've got a challenge here. Rather than try to like 
we gotta work. We gotta work this out. Like we gotta deal, with, figure it out for her, for her or him, yeah. rather than hey, they. how are we gonna figure this out? Yeah, they. Thank you. Um, an example was uh, I had the opportunity to go to Papua New Guinea uh, with the old production company I worked with. Fantastic, but um, you know, for me that was working with the crew, uh, the cam op about how are we gonna navigate this. The director, uh, he was a big dude. Um, the camera op they just talked about, Sean, he ended up piggybacking me in my cases. <laughs> I was totally on board for that because of the opportunity. Uh, for someone else, that might not be an opportunity at all. They'll be like, that's not going to happen. So, so those conversations, I think, is probably the real way it plays out. Um, maybe not necessarily the best way to play out. Um, but Q Taylor, uh, work NZFC is doing in this space, and potentially how it could be better in the future. Um, it was something that it didn't end up coming to fruition, which is unfortunate because I was kind yeah. of the first time you navigate into that space, you mm. learn a lot, yeah. unfortunately, with someone, yeah. you know, by your side. Mm. But, you know, I think if those things happen, you have to act so quickly yeah. from what your shows have shown and from what I have seen, it takes so much time. And I, I don't want that to be a barrier, but it is. Yeah. Mm. And look, and, that, and that's our life as well. But that, and that's the thing that's what we don't want to happen, right? We want to yeah. be on the camera as many chances as we can. And um, yeah. so, do you guys want to? Um, is this on? Yeah, yes. it is. Um, kia ora, my name's Taylor, and I am um, from the Film Commission. So we have been working on an initiative over the last few months in partnership with Screen Australia and a UK organisation called Bridge 06. Uh, and so Bridge 06, um, have created an access coordinator training program. And they've been rolling this out for a couple of years um, and invited us in Screen Australia to kind of pilot and launch it in Australasia. Uh, and a couple of weeks ago, we funded three um, disabled or neurodivergent screen practitioners from New Zealand to go over to Sydney alongside nine Australian filmmakers to undertake training to become qualified access coordinators. Um, and so they're back now um, in New Zealand and they're ready to go. And essentially it is a below the line role, um, very similar to an intimacy coordinator um, in terms of you know their role on set. And they work with production to ensure that access requirements and adjustments are made for disabled or neurodivergent cast and crew. Um, and so it is something that we are just in the very beginning stages of uh, in New Zealand and a big role for us at the Film Commission and the wider industry will need to do as well is really supporting these people uh, and educating the industry on how we can implement this role. Um, but that is one way that we, um, or one avenue that we're looking at. And the thing is, though, with this, there's struct, there's infrastructure mm. that to mm. support someone who has a physical disability. And when you're working in the industry, the practical side of it is you are incredibly agile and you have to make decisions really quickly. It doesn't have the luxury of sitting and doing that. It's like you're, you're off the cuff trip to Papua New Guinea. You had to make a choice mm -hmm. if you wanted to go on that. That it wasn't, there wasn't enough time, leave time to allow for that accessibility. So mm. you had a solution. Yeah. Have. So the key thing about the accessibility coordinator uh, experience in the UK in the last two years is absolutely getting people in as early as you can. And a key aspect of it is assessing the accessibility needs of your cast and crew, uh, as, as and when you bring them on. Um, and the more time you have, obviously, the more the more things you can put in place. And what they, from their experience, the last couple of years, the earlier you come in, the less expensive it is to the production at the other end because you're not making things up as you go along. You've actually forecast as much as you can. The one thing they did say was um, sometimes there's not massive accessibility requirements needed. It's just a bit of thought, and we do that around health and safety all the time, and have done because that's become the norm because it's law. And actually, this is where this could could go in the end, is actually has to come in nice and early, in development, in, in prep and then into production. Um, what they've also said from their, from their two-year experience is that there hasn't been a huge additional cost to production, 
which is the big kind of question mark. Where does the money come from? Sometimes there is additional money that's needed, but actually from their experience, it hasn't been huge because they've been planning I, I think, I and bringing it. I think we would have found a way to do it yeah. financially. It was more the time frame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, yeah. they're meant to arrive next week. I have no idea. Yeah. And I was like, I have 20 other buyers. Yeah, and I think that's part of the access coordinators as well, is so that the producer doesn't have to suddenly figure this out cold. Okay, this is someone who can come in and help facilitate, and uh, and knowing that we don't live in a universally designed world, so there's not going to be a perfect solution, but there's a way to figure it out because the options in front of you are figure something out and have representation or don't, and that that one really sucks. And as Dan said before, um, one thing I've you know, learning recently in the last couple of weeks, we were engaging around this process was the person with the disability or the neurodivergent um, needs to have access to the resources that the is making those those just yeah. all the time in their life and in their work. So actually, including them in the mm. solution, you yeah. might actually find they've already thought of it. Yep. Yeah. They had to, and, they had to do it. And so, so most of the time it's quite simple. Like, yeah. yeah. It seems yeah. to me like whoever it was bankrolling your project was being unrealistic with their time frame. Yeah. It's it what that sounds like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think, um, yeah. We, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, we've got another. Yeah. 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 Ye
Um, but I think Paula Fiji Jones has had a similar sort of issue as well with some of her work. Uh, I think, uh, unless there are any more burning questions, I think the main thing is to say, you know, thank you for listening. And this is a conversation starter, or you know, it's an ongoing conversation. Uh, so I'm definitely always up for the chat. I'm sure Joe and Rachel are as well. If you want to pick up the combos, uh, either here around the uh, at the cocktail function around a drink, or online, whatever. Very much up for sharing contact details and carrying on the combo. Thank you. Thanks, guys.